So um, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining uh, the June 2016 uh, GastroPlus User Group Webinar. Uh, the webinar uh, is part of our uh, webinar series uh, that we uh, schedule uh, approximately quarterly. Uh, the topic for today is uh, uh, focusing on uh, using PPK modeling to support uh, late stain changes uh, and potential waiver of clinical studies. Uh, we have uh, two presenters. Uh, the first presenter uh, will be Neil Parrot from Rose. Uh, Neil is part of our steering committee uh, for the Gas Plus User Group. Uh, he works in the modeling and simulation group. Uh, which is part of the Pharmaceutical Sciences Department at Rose, uh, based in Basel, Switzerland. He specializes in PPK modeling and its application to develop and projects at Rose from early discovery to the market. Uh, his particular interests are in the area of first in human PK predictions and guiding formulation development and pediatric drug development. He's also involved in research activities to better characterize admin-related aspects of the, physiology, of the physiology of preclinical species with a view of improving PPK uh, models. Uh, I'm sure all have seen some of Neil's publications in the area. Uh, Neil is also active in the IQ Consortium. Uh, and I'm sure everyone has seen uh, the papers that came out uh, last year from the consortium on the uh, PPK modeling. He has published uh, over 50 years, uh, 50 papers, and he has given numerous presentations at international conferences. Uh, the second presenter for the day uh, will be Christoph Istart from uh, Janssen. Christoph uh, is a senior scientist at Janssen Research and Development. Uh, he's part of the pharmaceutical development and manufacturing sciences department there. Uh, he's based in uh, uh, Belgium. He obtained his master's degree in pharmaceutical sciences from the University of Leuven and his PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from the University of Brussels. In 2012, he uh, joined uh, Janssen at Beers, and he currently holds the position of a team leader in physical chemistry and biopharmaceutics. He's responsible for delivering biopharmaceutical assessment of complex compounds and implementation of biopharmaceutical development strategies for CMC development. Uh, Christoph is also a member of our Gas Plus User Steering Committee. I'm excited for both of the presentations today. In terms of logistics, uh, there is a questions panel uh, that you can all submit questions. Uh, we will collect the questions and uh, address them at the end of the presentations. Uh, if there is a lot of questions after the first presentation, we might take a short break and address some of them. Either, otherwise, we'll cover all the questions at the end of the presentations. So with that, Neil, uh, it's all yours. Thanks very much, Philippos, and uh, thanks uh, to the Gastro Plus user group for the opportunity to share with uh, you this uh, case study in avoiding relative bioavailability bio studies. In outline, then, uh, my presentation will uh, cover the following. I'm going to start uh, with some background to our project and also looking at the particular drug and its biopharmaceutical properties. I'm then going to move on to the building of the PVPK absorption model, preclinical data, and then verification of the model using clinical data. I'm then going to describe how we use this model to make a case uh, to avoid uh, relative bioavailability study. 
I'm going to show you what was the response of the health authority. Uh, it was a negative response and so we carried out the study and I'm then going to show you how the study results compared to our prediction. And then I will move on to further application of the model uh, for prediction of the effect of particle size changes on absorption and conclude with some uh, outlook. So firstly, the background to this project, it was back in 2010 that we were entering phase three uh, clinical trials for our drug, which was being developed for the treatment of schizophrenia. And at that time we held an end of phase two meeting with the FDA. Uh, we didn't have an intravenous formulation for our drug and we requested that uh, an absolute bioavailability study could be waived. The FDA agreed with this request. However, they requested that we should perform a relative BA study to compare our market tablet formulation to either a solution or a suspension formulation. Now, we had spent a lot of time in um, building a PVPK model for our compound by this stage and we'd increased our confidence in the model to the extent that we felt that this relative BA study would not add significant information. And so we decided to document our work and submit that uh, back to the FDA with the request to waive that study. And so in the next slides, I'd like to describe to you the report that we prepared and the contents in terms of the data. Firstly, the biopharmaceutical properties of our molecule. This is a lipophilic molecule which is neutral and has a good permeability. However, the solubility is low, particularly in aqueous buffer. It is slightly higher in bioirrelevant media uh, for the fasted state and the solubility is further enhanced in the fed state simulated intestinal fluids. Solubility in the stomach was comparable to that uh, measured in the fasted state intestine. And the predicted clinical efficacious dose for our compound was not high, uh, being around 20 milligrams. So we had used PBPK modeling with this molecule going right back to preclinical times and indeed we had applied our usual strategy at Roche for the first in human PK prediction whereby we start with PBPK modeling in the animal species, usually in the rat to begin with. So we take the compound specific physicochemical data, we take in vitro data relevant for the rat, so rat hepatocyte clearance for example. We integrate these predictive data into our rat model and then we simulate what we expect based on these in vitro uh, inputs. So obviously then we can compare that simulation to real in vivo data uh, as, which is collected as part of the routine preclinical work and so we will often see some mismatch here which may uh, lead to us further working on the understanding uh, of the model, perhaps generating additional data and refining the model. So. The purpose of this whole exercise is that we first start with the rat, uh, 
gain some understanding. We can then move to a second preclinical species, perhaps the dog or the monkey, and perform the same exercise there, um, integrating the species-specific data. So this whole process enables us to build up our confidence in the understanding of the PK before we make our final prediction of human PK. So that's the process we followed with this molecule. We use the rat and the monkey in this case as our preclinical species for verification. And we predicted in human that we would have a very low clearance, a volume of distribution of around 3 liters per kilogram. And we expected good absorption and high bioavailability of our drug. At the bottom of this uh, slide, you can see uh, a comparison of our predicted pharmacokinetics to the actual first clinical data. On the left-hand side, you see a simulated dotted line using the model for a 50 milligram dose, and the symbols represent the actual uh, measured uh, mean plasma PK in the healthy volunteers. And then on the right-hand side, you can see a comparison of the dose-normalized AUC across the full dose range, which was tested in a single-dose study going right up to 240 milligram. And you can see that we predicted really quite nicely across the full dose range here. So this was encouraging that we were understanding uh, the PK of our molecule well. Uh, however, we, we um, continued to uh, generate uh, data. And uh, in particular here on uh, the top, we carried out a mass balance study where we were able to uh, show that uh, for an 80 milligram dose of our compound, uh, only between 5 and 15 percent of the uh, dose was recovered in feces, indicating that the um, predicted high fraction absorbed using the modeling was uh, confirmed by clinical data. The multiple dose PK study also was well predicted based on our uh, PK model. So there was no uh, unexpected uh, nonlinearity in moving to multiple doses. And then importantly, uh, our compound was metabolized by CYP3A. So there was potentially uh, a risk of um, intestinal first pass metabolism. We hadn't expected that though, given the low uh, turnover of the drug in vitro. And the clinical uh, study with ketoconazole, a strong inhibitor of CYP3A, also confirmed the minor role of intestinal first pass. So now moving on to more uh, uh, the absorption related uh, properties. And we had performed a food effect study with our molecule, again at an 80 milligram dose. And using our model, uh, we had integrated the measured in vitro solubility for fasted and fed states. And using the standard uh, GastroPlus fasted and fed state models, which adjust also the gastric emptying as well as uh, some other uh, relevant parameters, we had simulated uh, what we would expect, and that was that uh, there would be a very slight increase in exposures in the fed state compared to fasted. And at the bottom, you can see uh, the actual clinical data uh, from the, the study. And again, uh, the slight impact on CMAX was well captured uh, by the model and the negligible, negligible change in AUC was also as expected. At this stage, it's interesting to look at a parameter sensitivity analysis 
using our Gastro Plus model. And here we're looking at uh, some of the key absorption related uh, inputs. So as expected, uh, there's very little sensitivity to the permeability over this range explored. There was no sensitivity at all to precipitation in the model. Of course, as solubility starts to fall off, we get an expected uh, reduction in exposures. And also, there is a predicted sensitivity to particle size as soon as the particle radius exceeds uh, the value of 6 microns, there's quite a steep fall off. In, in this case, we're looking at Cmax. So we really would expect a sensitivity to particle size uh, with this uh, compound. And indeed, we had uh, data with which to um, verify that predicted sensitivity because a relative BA study was carried out using tablets uh, which contained uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient prepared with either a jet milling which produced much finer particles with a mean particle radius of around 2 microns and the other tablets were prepared using hammer milling which is a much coarser milled material with uh, roughly uh, uh, at least five-fold higher mean particle radius. And you can see from the bottom of this slide that there was um, a difference in the exposures with these two tablet formulations. And the line is the simulation with our model uh, just using these mean particle uh, sizes as inputs. So again, it seems that we are reasonably well capturing this sensitivity uh, to particle size using our Gastro Plus model. OK, so let's sum up now. Um, I've shown you quite a few uh, clinical examples uh, where we've been able to show that our model is really capturing well the pharmacokinetics of our compound. And the absorption related factors such as the particle size, food effect, are quite well captured. We've also shown that the, there is no significant first pass metabolism for our compound. And if you remember from the ascending dose study, there was a slight indication that doses might fall off, uh, exposures might fall off at the very highest dose. However, at the range of interest, uh, for our molecule, which is below 80 milligrams, bioavailability is expected to remain well above 80%. And so this is why, given all these data, we felt that um, the exposures in the dose range of interest were unlikely to be substantially increased by a different oral formulation. Therefore, we felt that the requested relative bioavailability study with solution compared to the tablet um, could be replaced by simulation. And this is what was simulated using the model. So you can see here very negligible differences expected. So. Uh, that was the request made, and to our disappointment, this was not accepted by the FDA. And so we went ahead and uh, we performed the relative BA study using a suspension. And these are the data from that study, uh, which was performed in 16 healthy volunteers. Uh, you see the dotted line is our market tablet formulation and the suspension is in the solid line. So yeah, these two were actually bioequivalent.
And again, on this slide, just a comparison now side by side of what had been simulated and what had been observed. And at the bottom, again, looking at AUC uh, and CMAX, uh, the expected uh, similarity of these two suspension, uh, two formulations was really uh, confirmed here clinically. Okay, so that's the end of that part of my presentation. And now I'd like to move on to some further application which we made of our uh, GastroPlus model as we progressed uh, through uh, phase three. And a relevant question which came up uh, towards uh, the time when we were uh, considering final uh, preparation of the market formulation was how much do we need to mill our uh, material? And this, of course, is a balance because we don't want to have reduced exposures due to, to coarse particles. On the other hand, to mill to produce very fine particles has cost implications. And we knew that from a technical viewpoint, our desired specification would be that the D50, so the 50% of the volume of the material should should have a, a diameter below 8 microns. And there was also, um, um, we knew that using the milling technology which we, we had, we could also reduce um, the size of the very larger particles, so that's the D90, to um, 25 microns. So those were the maximum uh, values which we would, were desiring from a technical viewpoint. And so the question was, could the model help us uh, to support that? So firstly, looking at the D50, um, it's fairly straightforward using GastroPlus with uh, particle size with monodispersed distribution to look at the impact on exposure parameters of increasing uh, particle diameter. And you see that with the line here. And remember that also we had the clinical data with our two uh, tablet formulations, which was nicely supportive of this predicted trend to uh, slightly reduced uh, Cmax with the larger uh, D50 here. So that was quite nicely uh, covered, but how to cover the D90 is a little bit more challenging. And the way we uh, decided to do that here was to create log normal particle size distributions where we kept the D50 at fixed values, but varied the dispersion uh, of the distribution in order to achieve a range of D90 values. So this table here is just showing that we were able to produce five different particle size distributions with a similar D50, but with a D90 varying over a more than 10-fold range. And then we can use those particle size distributions in our model to simulate um, the expected effect on exposures. And this plot here summarizes that uh, those simulations. So we're looking at both Cmax and AUC in terms of the percentage of the value that would be obtained with a solution formulation. And so firstly, looking at the AUC, you can see that even for a D90, which increases to over 100 microns, we're expecting a very, very minor effect on both uh, uh, on AUC with, with both uh, D50 at 8 and at 3.6 microns. The predicted effect on the Cmax with these distributions is slightly more sensitive, but nonetheless, as long as the D90 was less than around 
50 microns, we are still predicting uh, less than 20% reduction in Cmax. So this was useful then uh, to enable us to answer those questions from the technical viewpoint and basically to reassure us that with the technology that we had, uh, we would be able to meet uh, 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 formulation requirements. And of course the beauty of the modeling is that we can explore also this at a range of doses and really explore this thoroughly. Okay, um, I'd like to change again slightly uh, in order to mention uh, the role of the preclinical models in this work. I already mentioned that for our first in human prediction we had used the rat and monkey as preclinical species to verify our modeling and we had also followed that practice regarding the particle size uh, sensitivity which we had first shown to be a highly influential factor in formulation. And so we had de developed some prototype formulations which were designed uh, to show in vivo differences. And before going directly into the clinic with these prototypes, we had performed a study in monkeys. Just as a confirmation step uh, before proceeding uh, with a more costly clinical study. And so the advantage here was really that uh, if we have high confidence in our animal model, then this step is a useful one just to give us um, a chance to really build confidence in the formulations before going into the clinic. And in this uh, particular project, we knew from the preclinical work that we had um, really good simulations in the monkey. Monkey was our top species, and so we'd use the model to explore a wide dose range, and we were quite satisfied with the model. Um, and so we felt that that was uh, useful again here to use the preclinical model uh, to verify the particle size effect. And indeed, this slide shows you that for particle size effect, the monkey was indeed um, the monkey model was indeed doing a good job of predicting the in vivo behavior. Here you see the observed change between the fine and the coarsely milled material and it was very much in line with what had been predicted using the GastroPlus monkey model. And again, um, another utility of having uh, a verified uh, PBPK model was that we were able to use it then to obtain an estimate of the in vivo dissolution for our drug and use that to further uh, build confidence that the in vitro dissolution test which we were using to verify uh, quality of our uh, tablets was biorelevant. This dissolution test was not using bioelevant media, it was um, using an aqueous uh, medium with uh, added surfactant and so the, the bioelevance could be questioned. However, by building the IVIVC using GastroPlus, we increased uh, our confidence that this dissolution test was really uh, bioelevant. Okay, so I'm coming to the end of my uh, presentation, but I want to end with a few uh, comments on the question of whether uh, modeling and simulation can really be used to reduce or eliminate uh, these clinical studies. So 
the message from what I've showed so far would seem to be uh, a negative one, but I don't feel that that is the full story here because this work was done more than five years ago. And what we know is that in the last five years, there's been a very significant growth in the acceptance of PVPK modeling, particularly in the area of drug-drug interaction studies. Uh, so there was a draft guidance coming out in 2012. We've seen numerous papers, particularly from FDA, in this area. And we've more recently seen PVPK used in drug labels. So there's been really a growth in acceptance for DDI studies. It seems that acceptance for absorption modeling is lagging this a bit, and uh, that's confirmed by this uh, pie chart uh, from Dr. Grillo of the FDA, showing that back in 2014, uh, the experience with um, uh, the absorption-related PBPK modeling was really um, minor. However, I think that this is also changing. And uh, just mention on this slide a few of the signs supporting uh, that statement. Um, so firstly, we know uh, from this uh, press release that FDA are acquiring a large number of licenses for the Gastro Plus software. Uh, we know from publications from uh, workers at the FDA um, that uh, thinking is, is really uh, towards the great potential for absorption modeling uh, to uh, potentially support waivers. Although, of course, they mention in their uh, paper that there's need for confidence building. And uh, I think that that confidence building will come as we share more more examples where uh, absorption modeling has been used. And uh, at the bottom here, I mention uh, a nice example from Novartis, which I'm aware of, where they were able to use um, uh, modeling in an FDA review for both food effect and uh, proton pump inhibitor effect. And indeed, I'd like to mention uh, our recent Roche experience in this area. Our uh, drug, Alexenza, was recently approved uh, by the FDA. And as part of that submission, we included a detailed uh, report on uh, our GastroPlus modeling for both the food effect and the expected effect of proton pump inhibitors. And uh, we know that FDA um, took on board uh, that work and um, uh, indeed mentioned that in their review documents. And then lastly, and more most recently, we know about this uh, FDA uh, public workshop on mechanistic oil absorption modeling. And uh, we know that uh, Philippos was an active participant in that workshop, and I think that was a very encouraging uh, sign that things are really moving rapidly in this area. So to conclude then, I think uh, application of PVPK for biopharmaceutics questions is growing and is expected to have impact very soon, and that impact will be in the areas including food effect modeling effect of gastric acid inhibitors on uh, absorption and relative BA waivers. Thank you very much. And I'd like to lastly acknowledge some colleagues who um, were involved in this work that's been shared with you today. And should you wish to look into more detail on some of this work, there are uh, several papers published in the last few years. Thank you very much. Thanks, Neil. Um, before we move to Christophe's presentation, there are a couple of specific questions here that it might be easier if we just address them now uh, before we 
change slides. Um, so if uh, so, the first question is: in slide nine, there is a primary permeability mentioned. Um, what is the method that we are using to estimate permeability? Okay, I'm going to slide nine. Right, so permeability was estimated using the CACO2 assay and was scaled to human jejunal permeability using in-house uh, data for a series of reference drugs where human jejunal permeability has been measured in vivo studies. And so that is our usual way of inputting uh, our CACO2 data into the GastroPlus model. Thanks. Uh, on slide eight, uh, the CMAX ratio was predicted as 1.4 and it was smaller, but the PK suggests some difference on the AUC if you look at the plots. Um, Yes, indeed. So there was a slight uh, difference in the observed AUC. Um, you can see here it's around 10%, whereas we predicted no change. And okay. um, ex exactly why that is, I, I'm, I'm not really able to, to say. OK. Um, a few more specific to your presentation. So. Uh, for this simulation of the fasting and fed, uh, is the fasting and fed solubility of the compound tab used as input? Right. So, yes, indeed, uh, they were used directly on the compound um, screen to input those uh, values. Um, that's not what I would do now. Um, I would tend to use the bile salt model, uh, which has been introduced in GastroPlus. Um, and remember, this modeling was done uh, quite some years ago. And um, at that time, I think that the bile salt models had not been fully added. Um, there is a lot of questions of whether you can share, uh, whether FDA provide any rationale for rejecting the models. Uh, yeah. Um, and that's a, unfortunate that we, I don't, I'm not able to really uh, give a lot more information on that. Um, of course, you know, we were, we were hopeful that this might allow us to avoid this um, this study, but um, when we received the negative response, we really wanted to move ahead with our molecule, and so um, the decision was made. Okay, we will we will go ahead and do do the study as requested without too much um, dispute. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I think in the interest of time, uh, we will move to the second presentation. Uh, there are a couple of more questions that we can cover. They are more general, so we can cover them at the end of the presentation. So I think with that, we'll move to Christoph's presentation. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you to GastroPlus User Group for organizing this seminar and uh, for the possibility to present this work. So I'll talk some about a case study where we use mechanistic modeling of absorption to simulate disposition uh, after API process optimization uh, during late phase development. So start with some of the presentation outline. Uh, some background information, um, the formulation development background, so what changes in transition going from early development to late development. 
the objectives of the actual modeling work, the approaches that were used, so mainly on the mechanistic modeling of absorption and the additional supportive information that was used. Uh, the conclusions from um, the entire study, a small summary and some words on the regulatory feedback that we received. So first of all, the compound, um, according to the BCS class uh, system, this is the BCS uh, class 4 compound. It's a neutral one with intermediate lipophilicity. It's a very low solubility in water, but it gets significantly solubilized uh, bile salts or added. Um, compound shows a dose on your PK with uh, mean absolute oral bioavailability of about 65 to 70 percent, very fast Tmax, no food effect was observed, and uh, there is no time dependent PK following single and multiple dose administration. So, uh, related to the formulation development and where we needed the mechanistic model of absorption for, there are some items to take into account, uh, transitioning from early development to late development. So, first of all, we had the granulation process changes from high shear granulation to a fluid bed granulation. During crystallization of the API, there was also an inline milling step uh, added. Um, so we had a transition from non-particle engineered API to particle engineered API, um, getting a more narrow particle size distribution and reducing the amount of fines and very coarse particles that were present in the non-particle engineered API batches. So related to the formulation itself, um, we had a mixture of um, high shear granulation and fluid bed granulation formulations uh, for the early API batches um, and the particle engineered API was used for resupply of the fluid bed granulation. So the early API batches non-particle engineered very broad particle size distribution. Um, for the very first batches, more narrow or more similar to the particle engineered uh, batches for the later batches. And uh, just to complete the story, uh, going to transitioning early, late, uh, non-particle engineered to particle engineered compositions or the formulations were kept identical. So this gives you an overview of uh, the particle sizes that were used in the clinical studies. So we had quite a lot of API batches used in the studies. Non-particle engineered API, particle engineered API. So if you look at the particle engineered API lots related to D50 values, D10, D90, and the distribution, all of these are very similar. For the non-particle engineered APIs, the later lots also had quite a similar distribution uh, where you can notice that uh, the D10 value is more fine compared to particle engineered. The D90 value is more broad uh, compared to the particle engineered. And from the very early batches, you had some with a much higher D50 value and um, a lot of very coarse particles if you look at the D90 value. So just to study what was going on during our phase three trials, we also had a look at um, the four phase three uh, trials that were ongoing and uh, the different doses from the drug product and the amount of patients receiving non-particle engineered, particle engineered and a mixture of both. So just to go through the slides. The first uh, number is the amount of patients receiving non-particle engineered um, API at uh, randomization of the study. Well, the second number is the amount of patients receiving non-particle engineered or particle engineered uh, tablets um, at the primary endpoint. So during the transition uh, from a number of these clinical studies, you had more patients going to the particle engineered API than the start. So if you look at the objective of why we have been doing this, um, we want to have a look at are there any potential effects of the particle size comparing um, 
the somewhat more broad uh, distribution and the higher amount of coarse particles from the non-particle engineered API going to the later phases with the particle engineered API. And we used a variety of techniques to assess and evaluate this, uh, mainly based on the mechanistic modeling of absorption, also looking at API comparability, um, exposure comparison across all the phase one studies that we had available, and with some engineered API, a relative by availability study and, and Beagle Docs. So related to the mechanistic modeling of absorption, uh, where did we pay attention to? So first of all, get the most appropriate absorption and PK model in the model. Um, we had a look at uh, the regional percentage of the absorption and the gut lumen concentration time profiles when we compare our predictions for non-particle engineered API and the particle engineered API. Further assess the effects of the particle size on the exposure for the immediate release formulations. And uh, lastly, evaluate uh, the predicted bioequivalence of the tablets uh, manufactured with particle engineered or non-particle API. So all of this work was done in 2010, 2011. At that time, uh, we've been at uh, Gastro Plus version 7. Most important parameters that we use for the methodology, so you had the biopharmaceutical uh, property setups, molecular structure that was introduced, uh, diffusion coefficients, solubility, permeabilities, blood plasma concentration ratio, plasma protein binding, um, formulations that were used, uh, also the vessels fat, dose volumes, particle size distributions, the physiology, and PK was described by compartmental PK, and predictions were done at three different dose levels. So the 50 milligram, 100 milligram, and a 300 milligram tablets. This is just a short summary of whatever we have done for the model validation across different dose levels. And if you look at the parameters predicting um, the uh, in vivo exposure uh, for 50 milligram, 100 milligram, 200 milligram single dose, uh, we had a very good match between the actual in vivo data and the predicted uh, time profiles. Secondly, based on this, um, and due to the presence of the very coarse particles, we also had a look at the regional absorption predictions uh, that are available in GastroPlus. So, uh, not too much difference was observed. So the top one is a non-particle engineered API lot. The bottom one is a particle engineered API lot. In this simulation, quite a lot of coarse particles were present. And there was about a 5% difference in uh, more distal absorption that's being predicted. But still, for both, uh, a very good prediction was, uh, was obtained with a very high fraction absorbed. Secondly, uh, parameter sensitivity analysis was performed for the mean particle size to have a feeling about the boundaries that were allowable towards exposure, the particle shape factor, as the models are based upon perfectly spherical particles, which is a look at whatever you would go to a more cylinder-like um, particle, and the standard deviation of the particle size, and to have a look at particle size distribution. So we examined a very broad range for the mean particle size, also the particle shape factor, and a very narrow distribution for the particle size, and a very broad distribution. This across uh, different dose levels, going from 10 milligram dose up to 1,000 milligram dose. So what we did we observe during the parameter sensitivity analysis? Um, we had a look at changes in the fraction absorbed that was predicted, changes in Cmax, changes in uh, Tmax. Um, across different doses, 10, 20, 50, 100, 200, 500, and 1,000 milligrams. First of all, the particle diameter. Um, very high absorption is predicted across all doses up to a D50 value of about uh, 75, 80 micrometers. It's 
only after that that uh, fraction absorption seems to decline slightly. Secondly, um, we had a look at the Cmax dose normalized. Also there, up to 75, 80 percent, uh, 80 micrometer, no difference were absorbed. After that, we received a decline in the prediction. Cmax. Um, Slight differences um, ranging between a predicted value of 1.5 and 2.5 hours up to 80 micron, uh, which was very consistent with what was observed in vivo. Particle size standard deviation was also assessed um, in terms of the uh, particle size distribution. Here, uh, a lot less variation is being observed in the prediction. So even when uh, the particle size distribution was uh, more broad, uh, little variation was predicted. Same goes for this particle shape factor, which uh, based on this particle parameter sensitivity analysis is not of primordial importance towards sensitivity for the model. So in conclusion, for the parameter sensitivity analysis, um, there is little to no difference in fraction absorbed for the mean particle diameters of 50 micrometers and slightly higher. Uh, when that uh, particle diameter was exceeded, there was a drop noticed. Uh, similar trends uh, for Cmax and a slight increase for Tmax, so a later Tmax. Uh, other factors, so the shape factor and the particle size distribution did not show as much sensitivity. So all of that uh, added to our thinking that there is little to no difference in whatever we had dosed uh, and used by that time. Um, just to complete the story, uh, we did run virtual bioequivalence trials uh, using different API lots used in clinical studies. So the particle engineered, which typically had a very similar distribution, uh, non-particle engineered API with a similar D50 value compared to the particle engineered, but um, slightly lower D10 and higher D50 and uh, D90 value, and a non-particle engineered API lot with much higher D50 value and uh, a lot of very coarse particles present. We did run some virtual bioequivalence uh, simulations using um, a subject size of 25, um, comparing particle engineered and non-particle engineered different lots at different dose levels. So this is an abstract of what was performed. and. Um, Comparing lots 2, 3, 4, and 5, no difference was observed. However, if you would compare lot 1 in the simulations compared to uh, particle engineered lot 5, AUC was predicted to be fine, no problems there. Cmax, however, was predicted uh, to be slightly uh, under bioequivalence limits um, because of the presence of uh, the very large particles. Upon repeating these virtual trials, we want to um, increase our trust in um, the simulations and not rely on just one single virtual trial, but uh, run 10 in total. Um, the conclusions remain the same, so the results were also very consistent across all the simulations. So in conclusion of what we have done is that there were four sufficiently power studies. Population-derived CMAX AOC values uh, would be bioequivalent between tablets manufactured from uh, particle engineered, non-particle engineered lots, regardless of the dose. For lot one, uh, large particle size, large proportion of coarse particles um, were predicted to be not bioequivalent for CMAX compared to the particle engineered lots. Uh, however, total exposure would be bioequivalent. So this is what was done based on um, mechanistic modeling of simulation. We've used some other approaches uh, for API uh, comparability. 
So a very thorough characterization of API obtained uh, particle engineered, non-particle engineered based on uh, physical chemical techniques uh, that are widely applicable, um, including in vitro dissolution rate um, in the QC dissolution medium. Also had a look at a pooled phase one analysis um, comparing single dose administration, multiple dose administration, and subject and patients receiving uh, particle engineered API and non-particle engineered API. So we had quite some subjects to compare with. Looking at the geometric mean ratio, no difference is being observed um, between both. Secondly, to um, have a look at the um, influence of the particle engineered API and the distribution around um, the typical particle engineered API, which we would have continued with. Um, we did do a dog study where no difference were observed in CMAX and AUC between different lots uh, with different distributions and diff different D50 values. Um, the only thing that we did observe was a slight increase in the Tmax value going to a much broader distribution and a broader D50 value. And all of this is also consistent with what was observed with Gastro Plus findings. So in total conclusion, uh, the differences in particle size distribution between the non-particle engineered and particle engineered API lots would not cause meaningful differences in the ORBI availability, and it was not expected to affect the exposure in vivo towards patients. So in summary of this talk, we had uh, the potential effects of the API particle size distribution on the oral by availability for uh, the non-particle engineered API used more towards early development and the particle engineered API more used more towards late development with uh, the inline milling step introduced into the crystallization process. Everything was evaluated based on First of all, mechanistic modeling of absorption with supporting information of physical chemical characteristics, cross-study comparison of PK data, and a bioavailability study in beagle dogs. It was demonstrated that the difference in particle dye distribution would not be expected to lead to any meaningful differences in the oral bioavailability. And based on the similarity of physical chemical characteristics of all API lots, uh, similar bioavailability of the tablets uh, were uh, supported and could be concluded that data from clinical studies uh, using the non-particle engineered API lots could be used to support PK labeling statements. So with this package that was presented, um, we did ask for some regulatory feedback asking the question here if the agency would agree on the data package to support drug product lots using non-particle engineered particle engineered API sufficient and that uh, the results from phase one studies using non-particle engineered API lots can be used to support uh, uh, labeling statements uh, without a relative bioavailability study. Um, you have the responses written below so that um, the approach seemed to be reasonable, but the answer would have been a review issue. And if the conclusions uh, from the submission could be confirmed, the relative bioavailability study would not be needed. So in support of this, um, all information required was submitted, and we did receive approval of the NDA. So thank you for listening. I uh, would like to end um, this talk with some acknowledgement for um, my colleagues at Janssen um, in support of this project. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Christoph. Um, if you have any questions for both of the talks, uh, you can now submit them uh, via the questions panel. I will start with some of them that have already been submitted. Um, I think this one can go to either either of you. Maybe you both can comment. Uh, 
throughout both of the talks, you've shown tablet suspension and solution simulations. Are these done just by changing the dosage form of the compound tab, or is there a change of the actual dissolution data that goes uh, behind the different simulations? Um, for the simulations that I've shown here, um, the predominant factor to change was the, the dosage form and the particle size distribution. Okay. So uh, not just running a D50 value, but adding quite a bit of data characterizing the distribution, which was different for basically all input parameters. Okay. Great. Okay, let me see. Uh, this is for Neil's presentation, uh, but either you can probably comment on this. So the comment is, uh, we're interested in using GastroPlus for regulatory acceptance of industrial chemicals, many of which have relatively high log P. Uh, the example that was so at least for Neil's presentation, uh, it was a low solubility and lipophilic. Um, based on your experience, uh, how sensitive are the simulations to variations in log P over a couple of log units? Uh, and you know, can you comment generally on the application of the models uh, across different log P ranges? Either of you. I'm sorry, Filippos, I got uh, cut, cut off. I had to redial. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, the audience member was to, uh, is interested in applying gastroplast to relatively high log P compounds that are industrial chemicals. And the question is, uh, how sensitive are the simulations that we are running for you know, drug compounds to variations of log P and you know, what the experience with applying uh, the simulations to log P, you know, wide range of log P compounds, like high log P compounds. If anyone can, exp if either you, Neil, or Christophe can share your experience mm -hmm. across log P uh, compounds. Yes. So if you're talking about an extreme value of log P, let's say above four, I think it starts to get very challenging uh, to get relevant in vitro data as inputs. Um, so I have worked with such um, molecules and speci um, specifically for the absorption I think um, you will tend to have a very very low aqueous solubility with such molecules <coughs> and high sensitivity to formulation effects which will be challenging. Um, it's also challenging to use the in vivo animal models uh, for such molecules because of uh, species differences uh, which are difficult okay. to, um, I don't know, you, you may have uh, different experiences. I generally agree. I, I agree with what you've said. Yeah, the higher the log P, the more difficult it is to get the correct data for the simulations. Yep. Um, okay, one specific question for Christoph. Um, could you please describe how you validated your model before you applied the model in the virtual B study to compare the two uh, batches? So, model was basically validated using um, different dose levels, different particle size distributions for which we had single dose, multiple dose clinical data, uh, food effect study, so basically close to everything that we had available uh, in order to look at the sensitivity of the model towards the known PK parameters um, before proceeding um, to the virtual trials. 
Okay, thanks. So, um, and a follow-up question related to this one. Um, what do you think the FDA response and review outcome will be if you can use the particle engineering clinical data to support well, if particle engineering buses were used for clinical data to support the labeling, and then the non-particle engineer buses is used for the final product. Um, that's difficult to predict, of course, <laughs> because that it will never be the case that you use a non-particle engineer for your commercial product as well. I'm not sure if it would have been more difficult, yes or no, because there is some indication that using a very large amount of coarse particles would not be beneficial. So I would have some doubts, but um, difficult to say, of course. Okay. Thanks. Um, question for both of you. Um, if the PSA the parameter sensitivity analysis shows high sensitivity to human PF. What approach do you take to set the appropriate human PF in the model? Yeah. Um, so one thing we we would do uh, potentially with with such a, um, a molecule would be to use the um, animal data to to optimize the PF, assuming that we have confidence that other factors are reasonably well uh, captured by our in vitro data. So that that might be one one thing to try. Thanks, Neil. Um, again, more general question. Um, can either of you of either of you comment on the model representing the shape of the particles uh, and whether you know that uh, part of the model has been validated in terms of good predictive predictability? So the influence of the particle shape. Well, it's it's a, it's a factor that we standardly include in our models, especially in the parameter sensitivity analysis, as it may have an influence, and that's something um, that is being looked at all the time in either your particle engineering group, crystallization unit, pharmaceutical sciences, and um, these profiles are asked from these groups, and they're always included. Uh, as well as a shape factor analysis. If it would matter, yes or no, and if it does matter, it's something that's taken into account for every simulation. Thanks, Gustav. Uh, I guess a general question for both of you, you know, about thinking uh, forward. Uh, to increase acceptance of modeling, is it just a matter of continuing to submit models uh, based and make recommendations based on models, or do you think we have to change the way we're doing the models? Well, I think uh, the um, the the colleagues from FDA in their paper made made a valid point that uh, we need to build up the confidence, and um, I think that that comes through sharing more and more examples, um, ideally in in peer reviewed publications, which uh, where we can have a f you know sufficient details uh, of the work that's been done, and. Uh, I think that's the situation we've had with the DDI, and it's slowly, we're slowly growing in the type of um, of DDI applications that where modeling can can have an impact. Um, 
and I think that it will come with absorption, but we need to, we need to continue with publications. I fully agree on that one. Um, uh, it's a more general question uh, again. Uh, when when you when you do parameter sensitivity analysis uh, for precipitation time, uh, how do you choose the upper and lower range for the sensitivity analysis? Well, um, usually precipitation times are measured in, in, in some sort of an in vitro setup and I usually just check the extreme boundary, so saying going from instant precipitation up to what has been measured use it as a median value up to no precipitation at all and do quite an extensive sensitivity analysis in between. Um, if there is a real influence of uh, the early precipitation time, um, we usually uh, adapt our in vitro setups to be more extreme and use that as a, lower, as a lower boundary of what is observed in vitro and introduce that to the in silico model. Thanks, yourself. Yeah. Uh, just a, a general comment, I think, with parameter sensitivity analysis, usually you're looking to to explore a, a, a relevant range, and be that driven by the uncertainty that you have around the input or the the, the technical um, achievable range. You know, if it's particle size or whatever. So um, depends exactly what you want to to get out. Good advice. Um, again, general question um, to both. Uh, what is your experience on the regional absorption prediction? Uh, have you ever compared to experimental data and how accurate that is? We have we have some examples um, of that. Uh, I'm thinking of one example where we used um, um, a timed release uh, capsule to release the drug in different uh, sections and uh, that was reasonably uh, close to what we had predicted. And I think the colon is a is a difficult one. Sometimes that can be over predicted. It's tricky, um, but we do have some other examples where we've we've developed modified release uh, formulations using Gastroplus, and uh, it's done a it's done a good job. I guess it it always depends on the specifics of the molecule. And the more distal absorption does cause some issues from time to time, especially when you look at um, compounds with uh, some aquasolubility and low solubilization by bowel salts. The residence time in um, the colon and the amount of fluids um, sometimes this seems to be a bit too high with uh, too much colonic absorption there. So um, for such compounds, the, the actual model is, is adapted there. Um, this is uh, Mike Bolger. Just, um, I'm on the panel. I'm going to chime in a little bit on this one. Um, we do, we, even in our workshop, have an example uh, for methylphenidate where they were trying to create the um, concerta extended release form of methylphenidate and as part of the development went into a rectal infusion over five hours and the uh, default model for the colonic permeability in that case uh, worked very well um, you know just simply setting the simulation up so that it um, ended up doing an infusion into the uh, 
Seekum and call and region over five hours uh, match the CP time data very nicely. Now, I will say that there have been a number of our users who find that um, decreasing the fluid volume in the colon for certain compounds where absorption in the cecum and colon is significant does improve the uh, uh, match to the CP time. In other words, if you see at later times you're overpredicting the observed CP time, it's possible that that's due to um, an extended uh, colonic absorption in the simulation, which was not actually seen in vivo. Um, so you can, you know, look at those plots. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, I don't know if very many people are experimenting with our dynamic fluid volume models. And so if anybody um, would like to have the mixed multiple dose files or the CAT files to um, use an, a full dynamic fluid model which transfers fluid from the stomach into the intestine and um, then, you know, varies the volumes as a function of time over two hours, um, you can just contact us and we can uh, send that along. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so, question for Neil. Um, uh, first question is, did you confirm the FA in the animal species using a measured FA? That was the question. I'm not, I'm not fully. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> so um, the the animal the advantage with the animal data was we had intravenous uh, data as well, and so we we knew the 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 oral bioavailability in the animal species, and indeed the, the PK in the animals was similar uh, in that they had low hepatic uh, clearance, and um, so yes, we 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 were able to to confirm our models in in rat and monkey. Okay, thank you. Second question: um, uh, Did you use the human data to further refine the model before model verification in human? Yes, yes. So. Um, there were some uh, some adjustments made to the model um, when we got the first clinical data. Not too many in this case, since the model uh, was was really doing a, a good job. Um, I think there was uh, refinement to the the permeability value, and um, yeah, it may be we also uh, we got some uh, some further refined data for the measurement of the, the clinical form in biorelevant media, something like this. So there w there's, there's always an opportunity to, to improve the model with each uh, new piece of, of data. Thanks. And third question, um, any, any theories on why food saw defect on CMAX but not AUC? Well, we had we had good absorption for this uh, molecule at that dose, uh, so there wasn't much room to really affect the AUC. Um, whereas, you know, Cmax, if you can absorb more more rapidly, yeah, good chance that you might be able to affect it. Um, question for either of you: uh, What would be the ideal way? to model compounds that show very high variability in the clinic and how much acceptability do you think regulatory agencies have for uh, such data for highly variable compounds? Well, I would say that very much compound dependent on uh, 
very much dependent on the, on the data package that you have available and the confidence that you can show in your model to predict um, your data package, the consistency of the predictions and um, the in vitro data that you have available to support all of this. But I would say that it's very difficult to have a, a very decent estimate on, of a number of parameters, especially when they're highly variable and you want to go to virtual biocovalence trials. Um, once again, this is Mike Bulger. Um, the variability, it always has a mechanism. Um, the beauty of the simulation is that you can look at each compound as an individual, and I agree with Christoph that uh, every compound is going to be different in uh, the mechanisms that are involved in the dissolution and the absorption. Uh, but the beauty of the simulation is that you can uh, dissect what source of that high variability is uh, much more accurately than you could if you were simply using um, you know, a classical PK model where you see the high variability, but you're trying to link it back to covariates that are um, macro in nature and relate to the subjects. Um, many times the variabilities are going to be mechanistic um, and it may be tied to bile salt levels if, you know, the uh, changes in solubility between subjects is really critical in terms of determining how fast it's going to dissolve. It might be related to the polymorphic expression of an enzyme. So when you delve into each molecule individually and really study what the processes are, you can get a clue as to the source of the variability and then you can just test that in the simulations. Thanks, Mike. Um, a more general question. Um, if we observe Tmax under fasted state is significantly earlier than the simulated Tmax, which setting could be addressed in the model? Well, you might. Uh, I think you might look at uh, the the dissolution if that if that is uh, is more rapid uh, than than you're estimating in the model. I guess that could affect the Tmax. Um, okay. A last question is not too much modeling related. Well, guess somewhat a little uh, related, but I think it's for you, Neil. Um, you, you did show some preclinical data, uh, you know, screening the formulations. Uh, the question is, are the preclinical screening used to go directly into a phase three or a bioequivalent study, or do you perform, you know, an, uh, a between formulation relative bioavailability study in humans uh, before pivotal study? Well, I mean, this this what I showed was the use of, of of the monkey study, really to get more confidence in in these prototype formulations before doing a a, a single clinical study, in this case a relative um, bioavailability study. Um, so I'm I mean the, I wouldn't do do more than one clinical study to answer the the question. I'm not sure I'm quite getting the, the the question right here. Yeah. And the, the person who asked the question has left from what uh -huh. I can tell. I, I cannot clarify this. <laughs> um, and I think that's pretty much it. Uh, there is no other submitted questions. Uh, we're almost on time. Um, I will mention that this and all previous webinars are recorded and uh, are available at the Simulations Plus uh, uh, website, the webinar uh, subpage of the website. We will also post on our LinkedIn group uh, uh, the link uh, 
for the webinar uh, recording. Uh, with that, I want to shout to thank again uh, Neil and Stefan for uh, uh, Christoph for uh, presenting today and Mike for uh, being part of the, the panel. Thanks to Relations Plus for hosting uh, the webinar, and we will uh, plan a, a third webinar for the year uh, in the fall. Uh, the announcement will be on our LinkedIn uh, webpage. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Philippos. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Philippos.